Yeah, buddy, and this week on the podcast, we're do- <sighs> Does somebody want to write that in? Do, do you want to write it in, or do you just want to leave it blank? Do you just want to have it say, do joke, or do you want to... Should we write a joke? Does that make sense, to write a joke before the show? You, you don't have to do it. It's okay. You don't have to do it. All right. All right, I can do it. I can do it. I can do it. I can do it! Yeah, buddy, and this week on the show, we've got... <sighs> All right, we're doing it live. We're doing it live. <laughs> Go ahead. Do it live. Hey, podcast listener. Even if you are alone in your entrepreneurial journey, know that today, right now in your earbuds, you are joined by thousands of entrepreneurs from all around the globe seeking to grow better, more profitable, location-independent businesses. If you'd like to learn more about what we do and download our entire back catalog, check out tropicalmba.com. Yeah, buddy. Welcome to the Tropical MBA Podcast. It's Thursday, and I'm sitting here with Dan. Dan, it is so hot outside. I am considering installing air conditioning on my scooter. Good one, boss man. Hey, you came over this morning, and you said to me, one of the biggest things you're seeing in our community is people getting to a pretty quick ten grand doing small business consulting. Yes. So walking into a small business and saying, hey, I know about the webs. I can help you skyrocket this thing. We're going to talk about that today, and I think it's an important conversation not only for the people doing consulting, but most people don't have the front end of their business set up correctly. And we're going to talk about what we mean by that. But first, uh, got a bunch of phone calls that we haven't been getting to, Ian. So what do you say we just play this one from Josh Plotkin? Hey, Dan, Ian. So you guys have been talking a lot recently about standard operating procedures that you guys use in your business. And I'm wondering what kind of SOPs you guys have for the community that you've built around this podcast. So for all the people who come at you wanting some of your time, what system do you have in place to make sure that you can serve these people without spending all of your time, you know, responding to blog comments and, you know, these 10 paragraph emails that people send you about their life story. And what SOP do you wish that people would follow when they contact you? I think this is an interesting question, Josh, because I want to like, I'm thinking about the, the history of this podcast. So as many of you know, we just finished a 301 redirect from our old domain lifestyle business podcast. We're moving everything over here. So I think we're on episode 218 right now, Ian. Okay. So, so we, we made everything like 1 to 218. And you can go download everything at tropicalmba.com now if you want to like listen to our story from when it was just me and Ian talking to 40 people. People are like, why did you do a podcast when you only talk to 40 people? Because those 40 people were awesome. Those were you people. And you know, if you're going to start a podcast that it's not worth talking to 10 people, then don't start that podcast. Does that make sense? If you have to have like a gazillion people listening and you're worried about getting ads on a thing or something, I mean, I don't know. That just doesn't seem like compelling content to me. If it's worth talking to 10 people, it's worth talking to one, it's worth talking to 100. Right. So, but, but the idea here is that the Dynamite Circle is the back end of the podcast. It's where the most intense business people that listen to the show congregate and then come to events and stuff. That is just a representation or it's an extension of what we did at the very beginning. It's how we interacted via email and phone with people. It's it's the kind of parties that we went to. It's it's, It's how we do it at scale now. Yes. So it is like that original mastermind that we started on this show. It is that at scale. I just have a couple, this has kind of been on my mind lately because it is an important thing, networking. Yep. And you want to do it right. So there's this common thing where people say, it couldn't hurt to ask. I think that's wrong. It can hurt to ask. Yeah. Because you kind of have like a little bit of a trust bank built up with any one person in the world. And if you ask them for too much, it's depleting. And people don't want you asking for stuff. So I think when you're reaching out to influencers, um, relevance is super underrated. Like, it's always relevant to be kind and to say, hey, thanks. Everybody can take a thanks. Okay. But if you reach out and you want to do something that's like sort of random and not particularly relevant, like some people just feel the need to reach out, I would resist that until yeah. you've really got something for them. So right. re- relevance, I think, is important. I got a great email from listener Ron So when I went to Hong Kong last time. He's from hongkongshuttle.com. And he's like, yo, Dan, I listened to the podcast today. I heard you're coming to Hong Kong. He offered me a free ride from the airport. That is so cool because it's that just is. plus one, man. Plus one. One. So the cool thing about Ron is he didn't ask for a decision. He asked for a sign off. I think that's so important. Like 
you know, if, if someone writes you and says, you know, when are you free for coffee or something? That's not, never going to happen. Right. Never because happen. if you don't know that person, if you don't know what they're doing, now all of a sudden, not only do you have to like read the email, but you have to think about when you're free. You have to think about like if you should meet them. And I don't want to sound like lame or anything, but every little bit that you make a busy person think about stuff is less of a chance that they're going to meet or, or hang out with you. Right. So I'm always thinking of ways I can seek the sign off. It's like, hey, I'm going to be in your neighborhood tomorrow. I'll be in your neighborhood if you say yes, right? So I'm going to be in your neighborhood tomorrow at the Starbucks on the corner. I know where you live because I Google mapped it and I'm creepy. Right. <laughs> would, you, would you mind meeting up at 3 p.m.? I've got this thing to talk about that benefits you. Right. And that's exciting for you. Here's another thing I've noticed about meeting influencers is that the more successful they are, the less interested they are to meet up about what they're successful about. Does that make sense? Unless, you, of course, you're a total boss. Unless, unless you're a, unless you're a guru and that's like all you talk about. But yeah, yeah. I want to I want to give an example, okay? Because I reached out to an influencer and a, a person of interest two weeks ago. Oh, yeah, yeah. Just a cold approach. So not only do we get approached, I approach people all the time. Did you use the game stuff? Do you say, "Can I read your palm"? I did. So I reached <laughs> out to this guy. No, this is this is serious. I reached out to this guy that's a professional race car driver in World Challenge, okay? Because I want to know what his life is like. I want to know how you do that. I want to know how much it costs. I want to know all this stuff. So You're a barrel of laughs, buddy. You just yeah. you keep opening up. You got layers. I got layers. So anyways, <laughs> I go down through the driver list because it's, all this stuff is online, right? Yeah. I go down through the driver list and I find this guy. And I Google him and I figure out that he's got a manufacturing business also. We've got a manufacturing business, right? So I think, oh, there's a connection right there. I look at some of his history. I look at the ways that in which he came up through the ranks as a professional race car driver. Oh, he raced the MX-5 Cup too. I want to race that. So, oh, I've got something to talk to him about manufacturing. I'm interested in the same series that he ran. And so I think, huh, how am I going to get in touch with this guy? Now, there's a couple other guys on the list too, and they're real famous, right? And they're doing the same thing. Now, why did I go with the guy that's not so famous? Because... I have better access to him probably, right? Yeah. The guy that's like famous on that list, he's, a, he's not going to have time for me, right? This guy, I've got something to relate to with him. I've got the manufacturing business. I've got the interest. I think that's important too with relevance. Like I, I, I don't know if this conversation, I had it in a dream in my head or something, but there's a reason why I'm not like pitching Seth Godin on stuff all the time because he's so huge that if, if we were to like work together, it just wouldn't work out. You know, yeah. I think there's something to that, that relevance. It's like Malcolm Gladwell was saying that, you know, it's better to be in the top of your class at Maryland University than it is to be in the middle of your class at Harvard. And that kind of makes sense when you're seeking out influencers, too. Like you want to meet somebody that you could potentially work with, like right. that you're you're in their stratosphere. Exactly. Like I think about like when Travis from Supremacy SEO came out and hung out with us at the at the Bali house, like we became fast friends and like did stuff together. Um, even though he was sort of seeking us out as mentors, but it, maybe we were just a little bit further along than him. Right. And that that works. Whereas right. so, if he would have come, come and like, li- first off, Seth Godin wouldn't let Travis into his house. Right. And, and second off, they probably wouldn't have found as much to kind of connect on. Exactly. I think so. So if Bobby Labonte is at the top, right, <laughs> and this guy is oh. somewhere in the middle, and I'm in the bottom. You're a Labonte fan? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Not really. He's just the one that came to mind. Right? <laughs> Anyways, if, if uh, Bobby Labonte is at the top and this guy's in the middle and I'm somewhere down at the very bottom, it's yeah. like uh, it's going to take me a long time if I even want to get to where Bobby Labonte is. Let's let's start with somebody two or three rings above where I am. Yeah. So we're talking no friction. We're talking relevance. And here's the final point: is I th- this is critically important. With I'll just admit something. I would rather someone reach out to me about a book that I had recently blogged about than about how I can grow my e-commerce business. And I, th- and I think a lot of people, they make that mistake. Like, look, I run my business now for six years. I pretty much know kind of what I'm doing. We have a lot of professional consultants involved that get paid a lot. The last thing I want is someone kind of writing me an email saying, hey, man, here's a new technique that you can use. To Does that kind of make sense? Like, I'd rather someone write me and say, hey, I heard you were in Moine last week. Did you go kiteboarding? Yeah. So I think that that makes sense too. Like when I when I reached out to Derek Sivers, like I didn't say, "Hey man, I want to pick your brain about startups." I said, yeah, "We're in the same kind of stuff," and so I, I mentioned some of those things. So does that make sense? It makes sense. Do you know what you know? What doesn't make sense? You know how much it costs for a weekend in World Challenge? <laughs> you know how much it costs to run one of those cars? <laughs> All right, let's talk about the consultants' handbook. How to make location independent income immediately. Zero to 10K, the fastest way possible. We got a phone call 
relevant to this. So let's just give it a quick listen. Hey, Dan, uh, I'm a musician slash entrepreneur, and I wanted to give you a call because I've been having a hard time finding a podcast or post that I can relate my question to. I've been recently approached by two successful independent artists to help build their fan base. One in particular asked me to promote his new album release. I've, I've been following your podcast for a while, and I say I, I love it. Um, one of the reasons that I love it so much is that I feel like you're speaking directly to me, the bootstrap entrepreneur. I was wondering if you had any advice based off of your bootstrapping business experience. Thanks, Dan. You can tell us at the end of the episode how much that racing car driving costs. I'll tell you then. Let's just... Please. You, you need to sit down. You're giving me power. You need to sit down. Well, we got serious work to do in our business, buddy. I mean, I got I got goals. I got ambitions. Just wait till <laughs> I tell you. Speaking of serious goals, I'm going to repost this uh, one-minute way to describe your business on this episode. This is going to be at tropicalmba.com slash consulting. Even if you're running a consulting business, you need to be able to say, my company helps X customers solve X pain point by this remarkable thing that I do. If you can't say that about your business right now, that's just an awesome thing that you can do right away that sort of up levels you. All right. So I think a lot of things here, we're about to go into a whole episode about it, but I just want to start with this rant. What you are embarking on is a journey to become a marketer. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, it doesn't matter if you're marketing music or Legos. You are about to tell the story of some artists and how they got to be where they are and why you should listen and buy their music. Do you know this uh, this band called Nikki Blum and the Somethings? They play music while they drive. This is them right here on the road. Where are they going? This is a story. NikkiBlum.com. It's Nikki, B-L-U-H-M dot com. And the Gamblers are a rock country soul band from San Francisco with a busy touring schedule. Uh, this is performed between Phoenix, Arizona, and Pioneer Town in California. That's so cool, right? That's so they're playing their music on the road. They're telling a story. Yeah. That's awesome. That's being a marketer. Yeah. I just want to bring that up because that's remarkable. That's cool. Right. It has 2.3 million views on YouTube. Can you imagine how much that would cost you to get at late night TV ads or whatever? A lot. A lot. And plus you can purchase the music right underneath the freaking video. So anyway, we're, I'm sorry. I'm interrupting your rant about marketing with the rant about right. YouTube. So, so let's take these guys as, as an example. I mean, awesome song. They did a great – that's a very hard song to cover. Hall & Oates, did a really a classic band. They did a really good job. But look, there's, a, there's 50 other people that have done an equally good job of covering that song. Why do these guys have 1.5 million views on YouTube, right? And that's your job as a marketer. Your job as a marketer is to get that out there in front of people, and that's hard work. All right, so the fundamental shift that needs to happen is that in this case – the clients are coming to the consultant and saying, this is what I'd like you to do. The masterful, so if you think about all this stuff like a sliding scale, you need to slide the scale up to where you're going to the clients and telling them what they need to do. Right. And it's the same sliding scale that happens from consulting to services to products to recurring products to platform products. Right. So you, as an entrepreneur, as you go through your career, you slide that scale. So it goes from, it goes from intern to employee to freelance to consulting to services to products. So we're talking about sliding the scale today. Right. I want to get back to, to uh, Mache, right? Because he, he's sliding the scale right now too. So uh, this is very common. Heard this story a bunch of times at uh, DCBKK. You know, I've got a consulting business. I consult small businesses online. So I bring small businesses online. I sure. help them. Okay. This is so classic. Classic story, right? But the, the but the problem is you're a consultant, right? And so you want to try and figure out a way to get the product. So the first thing, like you said, is to slide that scale and to get to a point where you start to whittle down on your services. So yeah. you don't do Facebook anymore. You don't do Pinterest anymore. All you do is PPC. All you do is whatever it is, you start to laser beam focus yeah. your offering to these people. And it might not be good for everybody. You know, but Here's what's going to happen, too. If you do whatever the client says, you're not going to be developing any unique IP. So what I'd say is, look, I'd look out there at what's successful in the, in the marketplace and what you think you can charge for. Right. For the music example, let's just take two sort of service clusters, like areas of value that you could kind of head towards for your product. One is crowdfunding. Two would be narrative storytelling. So you could offer them packages like go to djshmooley.com. I'll link to that. It's tropicalmba.com slash consulting. Uh, we'll also link to all these awesome songs that Nikki Blum and the and the Nikki Blum and the Who. 
And I the, don't know. And the gangsters. And, and the blowfish. I think that they need a little bit better name. <laughs> and the gamblers. It's the too gamblers. generic. Yeah. You need, you know, we need to work on the band names. So actually, that's a good start to the consulting business is you want to catch, you want to select a clever, catchy domain name that is not domain specific. So resort, ah. Uh, Wajiji. Yeah, maybe not. <laughs> you know what I like to do is like look for alliterative names like uh, Sean's uh, Resort Rebel or Rank Rat, stuff like that. Like where you take two, like our our company's name is Two Tree. Right. You take two random words and you smush them together and it's memorable. And the reason this is important is because you're you're already planning on pivoting your business. Yes. This is where this is the one place we call the spotlight marketing where. You're going to be telling your narrative. You're going to be telling your story as you journey through these, these things. Now, you want to do the opposite with your tagline. So, Ian, what would be a good domain name for a consultant looking to help people sell more online? Oh, I, I have no idea. I would just make up a word probably. How about rankrat.com? Rankrat. Let's use it. Let's, let's, anybody want to buy Rankrat from me, just send me an email. <laughs> All right. You want to identify a catchphrase or a tagline for your site that's hyper-specific. So um, in this case, I would say crowdfunding support for emerging artists or, you know, have successful crowdfunding campaigns with rankrat.com or whatever, okay? So here's the idea. Like, you're going to have to put your chips on something. And if you don't, if you do what your client says, you won't develop the unique IP and the track record and the unique knowledge. So even if the crowdfunding thing doesn't work for your first client that well, you're going to know unique things about crowdfunding that other people aren't learning. And that's the key to a successful business is having unique IP. Right. Intellectual property. IP, intellectual. not intellectual person. You don't need that. <laughs> trust me. Here's another thing that I would introduce into the uh, into the consulting model that I think is going to be big in the next two years. So all the small businesses that are paying for SEO and rankings and all this stuff, and none of that matters. Like everybody's catching on. Like I've been paying thousands of dollars for like SEO and all this consulting for a long time now. The only thing I care about is results. And I think that those are your key performance indicators, right? So I want to sell 25 albums by the end of the year. Yeah. That's what I do. I'm a consultant. The only reason I exist is to is to create sales for you. And I think that this is a really big deal for consultants. You know, these guys are going into these small businesses and they say, oh, I can get you rankings on Google. I can get you – I know how to do Facebook ads. All that stuff. Look – People are starting to get smart. They're yeah. starting to spend two to three thousand dollars a month and not getting real results. I think people. I think us small businesses are starting to smarten up, Dan. And I think we're going to start demanding sales. So yeah. you're you're not an SEO expert. You're a conversion expert. That's what I want to start hiring okay. for. And that's what I want consultants to be more of. I want you guys to be conversion experts. All right. So let me introduce another rule for the aspiring online marketing consultant. I'll call it the fifty fifty rule. Don't participate in any story that you can't tell. So you spend, uh, it might not go quite 50-50, but you want to spend about 70 to 80% of your time practicing, developing those results. So we're launching our first crowdfunding, our, our first Kickstarter for independent music artists. If you can't tell that story, don't take that client, right? Because what you're going to do is 70% do it, 30% talk about it. So that's the new business model. That's what all the people, Derek Sivers, Rob Walling, look to the people that are having success. They practition, then they do. Yeah. That's the narrative that people are going to follow. That's why uh, people are going to follow you when you pivot into your next thing because they know that you're, a, you're a, at the beginning you're a person, but these things scale up, right? Then you're a firm, then you're a brand, and you're a brand that creates results, it doesn't matter whether it's for musicians or for gas stations or for right. airlines, right? Right. So that's the flexibility that, you, that that's, that's how this stuff works. Okay, so that's the 50-50 rule. The next step, put a money nozzle on it, all right? So you're creating all of this. You're dumping stuff into the top of uh, whether it's like a cake. Uh, icing thing. Imagine the nozzle at the end, right? Right. You can plug whatever you want onto the end of that. It's completely modular and the shape of the icing changes. Right. It comes out as a star. It comes out as a circle. I don't know if this metaphor works, but the idea is this. The nozzle is your buy now page. It's your services page. It's your pricing chart that says, I will do a fully functional Kickstarter thing for you that's just like all that content I've been putting on my blog about the last two that I did. You'll see the same results. 
You're selling results, right? Right. It's complex. You're not actually selling results. Your clients want results. Right. You're selling the process. Right. So you own the intellectual property, the process of having successful Kickstarter campaigns. I can buy that on your website for $6,500 or yes. whatever it is, okay? So that's your nozzle, and that's going to completely, that's going to be modular. It's going to be changing out depending on what you learn. You know, I tell people, if you've got a personal blog, this is buy now blogging. If you don't have, is, here's what happens is, is people get into this space, right? And they start a personal blog. And they, then they think, well, I want to be a PPC comp- consultant. So they start a site called like ppcmonkey.com or whatever. Uh-huh. And they have a product on there and they're like, they, they burn out on it. And what they should have is their personal website where they talk about travel. They talk about exciting things that bring people into the narrative that's the top of the funnel. Anything can bring people into your narrative. And then your nozzle is PPC Monkey. So I'm Dan Andrews from danandrews.com. I write about travel. I write, this is exactly what I was talking about earlier in the networking thing, which is that you'll be surprised what brings people into your business. If you love street food in Bangkok, yet at the bottom of every post it's like, I'm the founder of PPC Monkey, you might get yourself a few clients. Absolutely, because you just built a lot of trust there with me. And when you're building up then the PPC Monkey story, once it gets superior traction or whatever, you spin it off into a brand and a standalone product. Right. So what we're trying to do as consultants is figure out that central spotlight and stick to it, run stuff through the nozzle, which is modular. If the nozzle's successful, then you start your other brand. And this is a year's process, right? So, right. Okay. So does that make sense? Absolutely. All right. So the next rule, Ian, is the one-hour rule. If you are a consultant, you must follow this rule, and it is simply this. Put an hour of content on your website. Yeah, buddy. We're doing this right now for Valet Up. We're working on the sales page, and then we've got like a little hidden sales page, uh, and we're sending people there through referrals and email. But yeah, the idea here is uh, we're working on a short video. Yes. Uh, we're working on tutorials. We've got written copy. We're going to do some audio. We've got some podcasts lined up, things like this. So the idea here is to have an hour of content. Have people come to your site. They can immerse themselves for an hour. This is another way you're sliding scale from your customers training you to you training your customers, right. from being an employee to being an a entrepreneur who owns a platform or whatever. So this is another way that you slide that scale, which is why are you going to go and sit in an office somewhere and explain to people what you do. Explain it in an FAQ style content on your website. Yep. Turn on a microphone just like this and say what you would say in that office and make it interesting, make it useful, make it opt in if you can. Then survey the people that are getting that content. Work with them. It's like a tuning fork. Exactly. Right? And so here's how you build this content. We just we're in the process of building it right now. The only way that you can build this content, I believe, is to talk to people. Okay, because uh, you learn a lot about people's problems when you talk to people. So you actually have to get on the phone. So we've probably done 50 phone calls in the last four weeks with valet parking companies and what they think about this new software that we have. Okay, and then we take their answers, we build a better product, and we build it into our FAQ. Right. So there's tons of opportunity to build content, and I think a good way to do that is off your customer's back, basically. Right. So I, I suggest, and I think you have to do this, you have to get out there and you have to start talking to people. Because that's really the way that you're going to create the content. If you're sitting in front of your screen and it's blank, it's because you're not interacting with anybody in the market. Yeah. Get out there and start talking to people. Right. So Steve Blank, get out the building, man. But ensure that your content is doing the pounding the payment for you at the end of the day. So once you know that stuff, FAQ is the best way to pump this stuff out. Turn on that microphone. Right. So the deal here is uh, you create a process and a product for the information that you're getting, right? Yeah. A bunch of people tell you some information. Hey, this is what sucks. This is what doesn't. Create it into an FAQ. Create yeah. it into a video. And this is you're doing your own narrative storytelling, right? This is your point of view. This is how your market should move forward. This is useful content. Legacy content, too. You only got to put it out once. You record it one time, and then it's out there for two years. So think about it this way, too. There's another slide. I love all these like sliding scales, like how these things work. You want to lead the marketplace. If you lead the marketplace, so if you say, you need to go to the artist and say, you need to have a Kickstarter campaign or you need to, to be doing the DJ Shmuley, like you need to be putting out a track every other week. Instead, you, so you should launch music that way rather than, now most artists are going to look at that and they're going to say, no, I would prefer to do the normal way that artists launch music, even though it's not working anymore because they're wimps, right? So then what you say to them is, well, I don't do that. Right. And, but let me, here's the thing. 
if you're having trouble selling your music, there's a bunch of consultants out there that are going to run around like chickens with their heads cut off for you. You can go work with them. When you're still not selling music, come back to me. In fact, while you're working with them, listen to this one-hour audio that I created that explains why the market's moving this way and why it's a great opportunity for you guys to pay me 5500 bucks so that I can launch every month so I can put up your narrative storytelling. And this brings me now to the final sliding scale. Get it to monthly. So you don't want to do one-off projects. What you want to do is bring clients into your roster that are willing to pay you every month for a consistent deliverable. That's why narrative storytelling is a great one. Um, so you could even have a rollout where, so in, this, in the case of crowdfunding, they should crowdfund a new record every year or whatever. So, or maybe the first year's crowdfunding, the second year's fan funded, the third year, you lay out these visions, right? And then you deliver parts of the process every month as you go along. That's leadership. That's leadership, buddy. And I think, uh, so going back to Macha, you know, one of the things that uh, we talked about with him is like focusing on one niche. So we're, we're, we're talking about changing the nozzle. I think that that's very advanced, right? You do yeah. that down the road. You focus on the first niche first. Like if you've got five, you've got five companies local in Chicago that you're doing SEO and Facebook and all this stuff for, just focus focus on three of them, the three that are flower shops, right? Yeah. All I'm going to do is I'm going to focus on winning for flower shops, right? Yes. And then from there, then you can pivot and you can put the nozzle on there. I want to tell you one thing that's the biggest misunderstanding with all this stuff, just to cast, just to, just to send us out, especially when people are doing the narrative storytelling with their own personal brand, they're terrified to say that they do small little humiliating things for small little humiliating industries. Like I help bowling ball companies in Indiana sell more online. I don't want to be the bowling ball in Indiana guy, so I'm not willing to say that. I want to be the strategist or I want to be the online marketing consultant. Screw that stuff. It's not going to help you acquire customers. But here's the beautiful part, and I don't think people understand this. Four years ago, I was the cat furniture guy. Three years ago, I was the parking equipment guy. Two years ago, you see what I'm saying with this? Is yeah. that and The concept I call it is you quietly step out of the back of the room. You creep out of the party. You know, uh, you're at the party and you're like, kind of like, well, I want to head somewhere else. I want to go back home. You just kind of step quietly out the back. And people, the bowling ball thing is all going to be fine. It's going to keep going without you. You can totally pivot what you're doing. That's right. And uh, if you need more proof, just go look at Mr. Patrick McKenzie. <laughs> hey, Patrick. The guy, I mean, it, you know, he, he is crushing it in small niches and he's taking the lessons that he learned to get into bigger niches. And this is the 50-50 principle and this is the sandbox principle, which is you use your business as a sandbox, as a Petri dish to test the stuff that you're doing. That's why you absolutely must take on clients that let you talk about what you're doing for them. McKenzie's a great example. A few years ago, he puts up a post He's sandboxing his business. He's doing it, and he's talking about it. He says he made $60,000 a year. Everybody comes out and says, oh, you should make more money. Oh, you should do this. Oh, you should do this. Patrick McKenzie knew what he was freaking doing because now companies all around the world, in particular probably in, in California, will give the guy a luxury car for a week's worth of hanging out at their office. Right. Okay? And now he's even slid in the scale past that where he doesn't bother to do, take on those kinds of clients. The point is, is that... By using whatever small of a case study it was to demonstrate, to do the work in front of people, to build trust, and that's brand, right? That is the essence of brand. They trusted him so much that if we bring this guy in, we get results. And in his case, they're right. And in your case, if you get good at this crowdfunding stuff or this narrative storytelling stuff and you start doing it, you start running expense experiments with real results, it'll be true for you too, and you won't be a consultant for long. I got a, I got a business for you, Dan. You want to hear about it? Okay. It's called paying somebody a bunch of money to race race cars. No, no, this is serious. There's a, there's a, there's a business. I think I, there's tons of businesses around Kickstarter. It's like how to start a Kickstarter, how to be successful at your Kickstarter. Here's my new business, how to become a company after you've just launched a successful Kickstarter. There you go. Absolutely. It's called uh, it's like ambulance chasers, but for entrepreneurs, yeah. go for it. <laughs> It's very difficult. You can imagine someone giving you a bunch of money on Kickstarter, and then you're like, you have cash flow, you have production. Um, and so, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of problems to solve around that. But You're right, because it's interesting. Like, crowdfunding didn't exist four years ago. Correct. So, you're, yeah, the, the, you're creating all these twists in the Earth's crust. That's a great place for opportunity. And look, it's not going anywhere. Right. It's not like two years from now, we're not going to be saying, you know, not so great. Wasn't into the crowdfunding thing. It's a shift. 
yeah. believe it. So go for it. And any anybody that's owned a small business can help these people. Right? Yeah, there anybody you go. That can, anybody that's owned an inventory business can help these people, right? There so you go. I can pivot right. At, so I'll, I'll see you later. That's, uh, <laughs> that's my plan for now. All right. Well, uh, I hope we can help you guys at tropicalmba.com slash consulting. So everything we talked about, plus that uh, little quick tip sheet so you can articulate your business quickly, all that stuff. Any parting shots, Ian? You want to know how much it costs to run a car on World Challenge? Absolutely not. (laughs) This has been the Tropical MBA Podcast. We're here every Thursday morning, 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Don't be scared to check out the website. We've got all 200 episodes ready for download. Hey, thanks for listening to the Tropical MBA Podcast. You can go to tropicalmba.com, get access to hundreds of back episodes and all kinds of other goodies. Load up your iPod. That is the cheapest way to fly business class on your next international flight. We will see you next Thursday morning, 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time.